Good morning. It's good to be in God's house today, man. Amen. If you have a Bible, let's uh, turn them to John chapter 6 today. Uh, John chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 26 through 36 of John chapter 6 today. And we're going to be looking at the book of John for the next several weeks. And the reason why is we're going to begin a new series. I'm excited about this new series that we're going to be looking at leading up to Easter. And the series title is I Am. I Am. And I just want you to know that uh, I appreciate everything everybody does, the cleaning the parking lots and all that, and, and everything that goes into a Sunday morning. Uh, but I also appreciate, and I know we've said it before, but um, J.T. Smith, he works so hard, and so I, I give him the idea of this I am, and so he took that and he ran with it. And so the graphics that he did for, the, um, for online, and those of you online, you got to see that. If you didn't get to see that, you can go back on either Facebook or, um, or YouTube later this afternoon. Just look at what he did with that. It's so cool. I mean, it just, it really, uh, JT, thanks for making me look good, okay? Yes, I appreciate that, if that's possible. So anyway, we're going to start a new series, I Am. And this series is going to be based on the seven I Am statements of Jesus, the seven I Am statements of Jesus. And each statement, as I said, is going to be found from the book of John, the Gospel of John. But before I even begin this series, there's something that I have to do to help you to understand, to understand exactly how, how, how important it is to understand I am and what that means. So we need to understand the significance of these statements that Jesus made. There were seven statements, as I said, that Jesus made that stood out in the book of John, I am. And so we're going to look at those statements, the I am statements, but I want us to understand. Now today... If, I, if someone said to you, I am, it, it, it would mean a certain level of something, but nothing like it did to them. In other words, if I, if I came to you and I said, Chloe, if I said, I am brilliant, you'd think, well, I don't know. I, I don't know Pastor Don very well yet, but I don't know if I'd classify him as that. If, if I went to you and I said, and, and, um, and, and Terry, I said, I'm amazing, you, you may laugh at me, Right? You may, you may agree with me, you may not, you know, but it, but it's, it, it, you know, it may take you back a little bit. Um, and, and Mike Thomas, what he would say is, I, I am all that in a bag of chips, right? That's in one of his favorite phrases, right? And that would mean something to us. We may agree with that or we may disagree with, I am brilliant, I am something, I am all that. But when Jesus made the I am statement, it was something totally different than I can that I can even put into words today. The, the implications and the significance of these I am statements that Jesus made was so much more powerful. In fact, when Jesus said these statements, I can see the crowd going, wow, I can't believe he just said that. I, I can't believe he said I am. And why would they do that? Well, immediately, it would be understood by the Jewish audience as this. It would be the very same words that they were taught since they were a little child growing up of the account of Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Now, I don't want you to turn there now, but you can mark Exodus chapter 3 in your Bible, and you can go back and you can look at that this afternoon, a little reading assignment. When God met Moses out in the wilderness, out in the desert, in the burning bush. How many of you remember the burning bush story? Anybody? Okay. When God met Moses when he was out on Mount Horeb in the burning bush... God told Moses, he said, you're going to go to the Pharaoh, the most powerful man in all the earth, the, king over, the Pharaoh over Egypt, and you're going to say, Pharaoh, let my people go. And I know Moses was taken back. He's like, well, you're talking about, uh, that's committing suicide. That's crazy. I can't go and say, let all the Israelites go. They've been there for 400 years. They're slaves in, in the land of Egypt, and, and he's not going to let his free labor go. And Moses is thinking this through his mind. And Moses gets to the point where he says, well, Lord, who am I going to say is, has sent me? I, I'm Moses. I'm nobody. And here's what God said. Tell him and tell the people of Israel, I am has sent you. I am who I am has sent you. Those very words that God spoke to Moses that had the power behind it, 
to deliver all of the thousands of Israelites from captivity 400 years to the most powerful man in all of the world, the powerful, most powerful nation that ruled the world, those words, I am, meant that I am God and what I say will happen. The very words that God said to Moses, I am, was what Jesus, the very same words that Jesus was grasping and saying, I am. So you know what Jesus was actually doing? Jesus was actually grabbing a hold of that and saying this. And that's why the people would have gasped. He was basically saying, I am God. Now, to you and I as Christians and those of you who know that Jesus is the Son of God, that's not quite as big of a statement for us to grasp at and, and to gasp at. But to those people, the Jewish people, for someone to say, I am, would have been saying, I am God. To the Jewish audience, it would have made them step back and said, whoa, wait a minute here. We know you're important and we know your teachings and we know your miracles that you're starting to do we know all these things are happening but you're you're claiming to be god it would be like if right now today if i could do it in a way that you would catch you off guard and say folks i'm going to tell you something right now i'm not don handle i am god and those of you who say whoa wait a minute here you, you may be a preacher and you may proclaim the god's word and you may do some great things for the lord but you're not god and I step back and I say, no, I'm not. I don't want the credit. I don't deserve any of that. But Jesus, when Jesus came as God's son, Jesus said, I am. He was claiming deity, the sameness of God. He was say, claiming that he was of the same character and nature of Jehovah God. To the Jewish audience, it would have made them step back. And to the Jewish rabbis and the religious leaders, it would have made them furious. And it did. It made them so furious that when Jesus began to make these claims, you know, what, you know what would happen if someone would claim to be God in that day? They would be punishable by death. To even speak the words, that, to claim that you were God, was to be put to death, to stone to death for, for, for blasphemy. But that's what Jesus was doing. And along with Jesus saying, I am, these seven I am statements that would have taken everybody back Jesus added seven different statements to go along that, with that to prove that he was God's son, that he was the Messiah, and that he had came to give life. You see, this had a spiritual significance, and it's still relevant today. Sometimes we look at the Bible and we say, well, how is that relevant to my life? This is very relevant to our lives. These seven statements can mean everything to a believer's life. We desperately need the great I am today, amen? Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. What was Jesus saying? I am, I am God, I am God, and I am the bread of life. Now to us, we kind of understand that a little bit, what he was trying to say. But to them, they were like, wait a minute here, what is going on? You see, Jesus was identifying himself as the bread of life from God. And that's exactly what we're going to look at today. In our scripture passage for today, in John chapter 6, Jesus had come on the scene. Jesus had come onto the scene, and he had been baptized. He, they, they had saw the Spirit descend on him as a, as a, a, in a dove, the form of a dove. And, and it also says that God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and Jesus had faced the tempted in the wilderness. He began to call his disciples. He began to preach and teach the kingdom of God is at hand. He began to do miracles on all that stuff, and that is exactly what's happening. In John chapter 6, to set the stage, in John chapter 6, Jesus had just fed the 5,000. How many of you ever heard the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? He had fed the 5,000. Now, that is a miracle in itself. Why? Because they had two fish and five loaves of bread, and it was small little loaves that a child had on hand. When he was teaching by the Sea of Galilee, and it says 5,000, and, and most interpreters, and I agree with this, that was 5,000 men plus women and children. So there was probably, <coughs> probably close to 20,000 people that had gathered to hear Jesus speak. And Jesus, we know the miracle, Jesus took the two, lo or the two fish and the five loaves, and he multiplied that, and he fed 20,000 people, and there were how many baskets left over? There were 12 baskets left over. 
So he fed the 5,000 right here at the Sea of Galilee. Then Jesus told his disciples, you go to the other side. You go to the western shore. We're on the eastern shore at this time. You go to the western shore. The Sea of Galilee, I've, I've been on the Sea of Galilee. It's so cool. It is about seven miles long and about five miles wide. So they were crossing the Sea of Galilee. He sent his disciples ahead. He said, I'm going to stay back. And he went to pray, as he always did, on the hillside, on the mountainside by himself. And so his, his disciples went ahead of him. During the night, we know there was a storm that happened. And during that storm, Jesus came doing what? Walking on the water by them. Let me ask you something. How many of you have ever walked on water? Nobody has. In fact, I heard a story one time by Bobby Knight, the famous coach at Indiana. He had a basketball recruit, super basketball player, but he had real long hair. And Bobby Knight, if he was anything, he was strict and he wanted his players to look a certain way. And the, guy, the kid come in, he had hair like halfway down his back. Halfway down his back. And so Bobby Knight, he says, you're going to have to get a haircut, son, if you're going to play for me. And he said, Jesus, he didn't, he didn't, he had long hair. And he said, well... He said, Jesus walked on water. If you can walk across that pool, I'll let you keep your long hair. <laughs> Needless to say, the guy got a haircut. You see, Jesus walked on water. He's doing these miracles. He's walking on water. The next day, this is a setting, the next day the people woke up. Some of them had went home. Some of them were still there. Some of them were seeking Jesus. And at that time, they woke up and they thought the disciples went ahead. They didn't know Jesus had walked on the water, the multitude. So, so they're looking, for, where'd Jesus go? Well, there's no boat that took him across. Where could he be? And they began to look for him. And then they began to go across the sea on other boats in order to try to find him. Well, maybe he went to the disciples. How? We don't know. And so that's when we pick up the story. These disciples had went across to Capernaum. Jesus had went and, and walked on the water, got into the boat with them, then they were at the shore, then they went to Capernaum, that's where they were, and then the multitudes, when they realized the next day Jesus is not here, he must be over there, they followed Jesus. But what we're going to see today is Jesus, people who follow Jesus, now listen, people who follow Jesus don't always follow Jesus for the right reason. Did you hear me? There's a multitude of people out there that are following Jesus, but they're really not following Jesus for the right reason. And so anyway, they follow Jesus, and here's the setting of this stage. Here's what we're going to read today. We're going to read this today, and it's going to, and here's what I, Jesus began to, uh, uh, at that point, when, the, when they all came across the sea of Galilee, Jesus been, began to assess and address the situation at hand. He looked at what was going on, and he began to assess that, and he identified three key things, and those three key things are what we're going to look at today, and we're going to be looking at those for the next several weeks, because I want us to get into our mind, if it worked for Jesus, it'll work for us. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us as followers of him. It's actually the very same thing that we need to identify today in our own context, in, in our churches, in our communities. In, in, in our surroundings around us. And it's the reason why Jesus made this first bold claim, I am the bread of life. Let's all stand and read this together. So remember the setting? All the people showed up and all of a sudden they're asking, Jesus, how'd you get here? Jesus, what happened? And here's what Jesus said in John 6, 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Remember, he just fed them. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. Because God the Father who has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe in you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in, in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, God, and I thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, Lord God, as we stand upon and I stand upon your word today, that it speaks the truth into our hearts. We know your word is truth and life, but God, I pray that we would make our hearts fertile soil for it to penetrate our hearts today, Lord, and our minds. God, I pray for someone here today who does not understand and know Jesus as the true bread of life, that they would receive Christ as Savior and Lord today. Whether it be here in their midst or at home, Lord, or out and about, Lord, as they hear these words, God, I pray, speak to their hearts and minds today. Father, I pray today for us as believers, as we've gathered in your name and we, we expound upon your word, God, that your word would speak into our hearts and challenge us and change us and convict us and make us and mold us more into the image of your son, Jesus. Father, we just love you and praise you today, and we pray that all of our attention, all of the glory, all of everything, our efforts that we are here today for is turned and given to you. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So this morning, here's what I want to do, and we're going to be looking at this in the same way. All the seven I am statements over the next seven weeks leading up to Easter, all of these I am statements, and we're going to be looking at three key things that Jesus identified. Every time he said, I am... He identified with, with, the, with something. It's the same thing that we must identify with in our communities, in our ministries. If we are doing ministries as a church, if we're doing church, if we're doing worship, if we're doing Bible studies, if we're doing outreach, if we're doing ministry to the people around us, we must identify these things. And the first one is this. We must identify the people. Now that sounds pretty simple. We must identify the people. This would seem very easy. It would seem very obvious. You know, ministry is about people, right? You know, here's the church, here's the steeple, open it up, see all the people, right? But the bottom line is this, we're not just ministering to the people in here. We do that, but we also are ministering to the people out there and around us. We have to identify the people. But so often we miss that. Right now in our life as Christians, as followers of Jesus, and as the one true church, as the First Baptist Church, we must identify with the people. But so often we miss that. We forget that. And sometimes we just outright ignore that. Too many times it becomes about us. Too many times it comes about what we like, what we want. Jesus was never about satisfying and pleasing himself, was he? Let me see you shake your head no. He was never about taking care of his needs. He knew his father would do that. He was never about his comfort. His, you know, right now some of you are, I'm very comfortable today at 65 degrees. I can tell you that. But there's days that it's 80 degrees up here on the stage to try to keep people warm. And I got I to sweat up here. Danita told me, she said, for the first time I thought I'd see you in a long sleeve shirt, Pastor Don. I'm like, it's very seldom you'll see that. Because I, I, I get hot and I start, my throat starts scratching, so i got to stay cool while I'm on fire. So, so, so many times, it becomes about us and not about the people. If we don't identify the people, that's the first step and the most important step that we can do. What people? It's the people right in front of us. Do you know that God puts people in your path for a reason, for a time, and for a purpose? Sometimes it's people we love, sometimes it's people we maybe just kind of like, and sometimes it's even people that we hate. But God puts those people in front of us. It's the people in front of us, it's the people in our path, and it's the people that God calls us to minister to. Do you know in your life, in this church, God has put people out there in front of us for a reason. We're not First Baptist Church of Quincy or First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas or First Baptist Church of, of Jackson, Mississippi. We're First Baptist Church of Pleasant Hill. And God has put us here for a reason and a time and a purpose and for people. Those people that are right here around us. I think we're doing a great job in many ways ministering to the people around us, but we have to keep very alert and very aware every ministry we do, everything we say, everything that we're about, what, how, the, how the people around us observe us 
and, and what they think of us has to do with them. In verse 26, Jesus says right off the bat, he said, Jesus answered them. And I can stop right there. Jesus answered them. Who are them? Who was Jesus addressing? Who was Jesus reaching out to? Who was Jesus ministering to? Them. Who were them? Well, we read the context of the back part of the Scripture, the first part of the Scripture, and we see, like I said, it was the multitudes. Jesus saw the people right in front of him. He wasn't thinking, well, maybe I could go over here and minister, maybe I could go this and minister. Jesus looked right in front of him and saw the people that God had for him to minister to at that time. At that appointed time, the multitudes were there. The multitudes were seeking and searching and trying to find something that they couldn't find in this world. Does that sound familiar? Do you know there's people all around us right now that are looking? They, they, they can't figure out what's wrong. They can't figure out why there's an emptiness. They can't figure out why things just don't seem to add up or work out. Or why does my life feel so empty? Why do I feel so alone? And all of that has to do with those people, just like in Jesus' day, in our day, that are the people that we need to be looking at. To them. Here's what he did. He identified his target audience. He identified, now listen to this, he identified his target audience. I think too many times we don't do that. You know, I can remember back years ago when I was a young lad, my dad bought me my first shotgun. Well, it was a 410. 410 is considered a rifle, but it was a single shot breakaway barrel Ithaca shotgun rifle and I can remember going out with that we was out on Pea Ridge and my dad took me out squirrel hunting and I can remember going out squirrel hunting and I so desperately wanted to shoot that gun you guys ever been there my first gun I ever had my dad had given it to me and I couldn't wait to shoot that and I wasn't going to go home until I got to shoot that gun squirrel or no squirrel and we went out and I can still remember the exact holler that we were in the exact, the exact tree where we stood and I remember seeing a squirrel run up that tree. And I said, Dad, I see a squirrel. And as hard as I looked, I couldn't tell after I saw the squirrel run up the tree where he had went to. You know how a squirrel kind of spin up a tree? But when I looked out, I was trying to identify where that squirrel was. And as I did that, I looked up and it was a big old oak tree. And I can remember thinking I saw that squirrel on the side of the tree. Now, I think I've told this story before. You ever prayed for a miracle? I was going to shoot that gun one way or another, and I didn't know for sure if I had identified whether that was a squirrel or not, but it looked close enough to me. And Dad said, I don't see the squirrel, but if you think you see it, you go ahead and shoot at it. So I pull that gun back, and I aim up there to what looks like it may be a piece of big bark or something like that on the side of the tree, but I was going to shoot that, even if I was just shooting at a tree. And I shot that gun, and a squirrel fell dead out of the tree. And I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus. The first shot, first squirrel, killed a squirrel, first shot with that gun. Now, what am I going to tell you about that? Sometimes as Christians, we try to identify the target, but we're not sure whether we're really aiming at a target or not. Sometimes we're just shooting up against a tree and hoping that we hit something. Sometimes we're eager to do ministry, but we haven't identified exactly what we're shooting at. You know what they say? If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Sometimes I think it's just like, um, Gary, Jeff, it's kind of like, you know, those guys in the duck blind, and they just come up and they start shooting, and they claim every duck that, that's killed. That's kind of the way we do in ministry. We're around everybody, and we just start shooting, and we think, I got that when I did this, you know, and, 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 and God's saying, you weren't even aiming. You're just lucky to be in the game. And the bottom line is this. Jesus identified exactly who he was targeting. I think sometimes in churches we don't get specific enough and identify exactly what we're aiming at. It's just like we have a scatter gun. We hope to shoot something. We hope we hit our target. Jesus knew exactly what he was targeting. Do you know your target audience? Let me ask you that. Now, what do I mean by that? Do you know exactly who God's got you in your path, in this church's path, to try to target, to reach? Do you know those people? If you don't have somebody in your sights, you know, I, I've told some people, I, I have a hit list when it comes to people who need to be saved. 
And I've got at least four or five guys right now that I'm praying hard for, and I'm praying, God, you know, put the bullseye right on them. And if it's me or somebody else, it doesn't matter, but somebody needs to witness to these guys because they need to be saved, and I pray that God would do that, and I'm targeting them. Do you ever target your prayers towards people? That's okay. That's exactly what it should be. So do we know our target audience? Do we know, have we identified the people we're trying to, trying to connect with? That's what Jesus was doing here. Let's go on. He identified the people, and then he identified the problem. Let me, let me ask you this. Do people have problems? Now, you guys are all people in here, and my target audience is you and anybody watching at home right now with the gospel, with the word of God, with what God wants to do in your life. So let me ask you this everywhere that you're hearing and seeing this. Raise your hand if you have problems. If you didn't raise your hand, you're lying, okay? I already know that. We all have problems, don't we? There's not a person in this world that in some way, some shape, some form, everything you might be going good, but you still have problems. So once you identify the people that you're trying to reach, the people, the target audience, then all you need to do next is you need to identify their problems. Problem or problems. Because most people have multiple problems. Like most multiple personalities, most people have multiple problems. So... So we identify the problem. People always have problems. I guarantee you, whoever God puts in your path, whoever it is God is calling us, you, me, to minister to, they've got problems. And once you identify the target people and identify their problems, then you're ready to minister to them. That's ex exactly what Jesus did. Look at verse 26 again. So Jesus answered them. Who are them? That's the multitudes. And here's what he said to them. Most assuredly, he's saying, very, ver verily, verily. He's saying, pay attention. My audience that I'm speaking to now, I'm going to speak into your life. Right now, God wants to speak into your life. Are you paying attention? If you don't, it'll just go right over your head. It'll, it'll veer off. It'll be like the seeds planted, and it, it won't be on fertile soil. Most assuredly, I say to you, seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you are, because, uh, excuse me, i got to refocus focus my contacts here. But because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Did you see what happened? You know what the problem was? The people were superficial. The people didn't understand who Jesus was. The people didn't understand Jesus. They thought the Messiah was going to come, and they did believe Jesus was the Messiah, but they thought the Messiah was going to come and set up an earthly kingdom and it even said in Old Testament prophecy that he would feed the people, that he would take care of the people. So here's what they thought. We found the Messiah and we found our meal ticket all at once. You see, we don't understand food today as we, they did in that day. Food was, was survival. You know, we think that we're trying to survive right now with food. They knew what it was to have to just survive daily on their food. That's why Jesus prayed, give us this day our daily bread. We don't understand that concept today. But they ate daily. When they were out there at the Sea of Galilee listening to Jesus, they were hungry, it said. They didn't, they didn't bring, you know, they couldn't go to McDonald's and order a happy meal. They had what they had in front of them. If it was nothing, what they have? Out of 20,000 people, there was one boy they found with, with two fish and five loaves. That's not very much food. 20,000 people but when Jesus multiplied that Jesus gave them fed them their bellies were full they thought you know what he's exactly who we're looking for he's my meal ticket if I follow Jesus and he's the Messiah then he's going to feed us just like Moses fed the Israelites in the wilderness uh oh Moses didn't feed the people in the wilderness who fed the people in the wilderness God filled the people. In the he used Moses just like he uses you. He uses the church to feed people just like we're doing now. But it is God who supplies. God supplied the manna. Now there's a problem here with manna. Do you guys know what the manna was in the wilderness? It was like this wafer loaf that they'd get up and, and the dew was on the ground. And they'd pick it. It's almost like I just envisioned like picking cotton candy and eating it, you know. It was sweet and beautiful and like sweet bread. And the deal with that was, is you took enough for the day. If you took too much, it was going to mill, it was going to mold, it was going to rot. But if you took too little, you'd still go hungry. So you had to know how much you needed for the day. Here's the problem, America. We have way too much, 
and it's all going to waste. And so the people said, well, Moses gave us manna from heaven. No, God gave you the manna from heaven. For 40 years, he fed you. He took care of you. Why do you not trust him to take care of you? How about it, people? Has God always taken care of you in the past? Then why don't you think he's going to take care of you now? Somebody need to hear that. If God gave you enough manna for today and did not promise you manna for tomorrow till you got to tomorrow, let's focus on today. The people began to think, we can just go to Jesus and, and he'll take care of all of our needs and he's going to set up this earthly power. He is the Messiah. They began to believe he's the Messiah, but they misunderstood that Jesus didn't say, I'm going to come and make your life just lavish. He said, I'm coming to give you something different. The problem today is, in Christianity, people are looking for something different than what God wants to offer them. Did you know that? People come to God when they have a need, and they want God to take care of this need, and then that's good. I'm good. Okay, God, I'll put you back in a box until I need you again. People come to church, and they're looking for all this stuff. They're looking for a certain type of music, a certain type of preaching, a certain type of Bible study, all this stuff, and they forget that God is the one that supplies, not the preacher not a church and when we lose sight of that lose focus of that then we're just like those people we have a problem and and wouldn't you say that the churches in america have a problem today can i get an amen they've lost sight of what god is offering they're not offering you god is not offering you a bed of roses and everything's going to be great and fine because we know this world jesus said in this world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer, because I'm going to give you something that will overcome the world. The problem is, we've lost sight. The problem here is food. They were so focused on the material food that Jesus could offer them that they lost sight of the big picture of who God was. Would you say that we live in a materialistic world today? Folks, as Christians, we can't lose sight of what God is really offering. If we don't get it, the world will never get it. Just like today, they were looking for temporary substance. They were looking for and searching for more. How many people do you know looking for more? They can't find it. It's just like this void they're looking for. How many of you know of people who just they are never satisfied? They're always trying. They've got all the money they could ever ask for, all the things they could ever need, and they just try to grab more and more and more, and that is not what God says. You see, the problem is food perishes. Did you know that? How many of you have ever went to your refrigerator and saw the cottage cheese container in the back and you knew that's not cottage cheese? And some of you are brave enough that instead of throwing it away, you go, that's been there a long time, but i got to see what's inside. And you crack that open and the only thing you see is a bunch of mold and things growing on top of it. You know what we had to do when, when our kids were growing up? Two things. If it was in the refrigerator and my daughter wanted it, she would write her name on top of it because my son would devour it if it was in the refrigerator. She would write her name physically, write her name on it, say, leave that alone, that's mine. Because he would eat everything. I mean, literally, she'd write her name on top of it. The other thing is we had to watch what we left in the refrigerator because our son would eat anything. He didn't care what it looked like. I still remember him getting in one day and, and after the fact, we found out that he's like eating a sandwich. Like, what sandwich are you eating? He said, well, there was some roast beef in there. And Lisa gets thinking, that roast beef has been in there for at least a month. <laughs> Tastes pretty good to me. <laughs> and he's got an iron gut to this day because he can eat anything. Food perishes. It has an expiration date on it. The, the, the problem is people look at things with an expiration date on it. And God wants to give us something that's eternal. Only God can do that. And Jesus, then he said, folks, you got it all wrong. God sent me. I am God. I am. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said in verse 36, or was it, what, what verse was it? Third, excuse me. I got caught up in this. In verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The bread of life. If you come to me, you shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. How many of you would love to have a hunger that was satisfied and, and thirst that was never, that, you, that was always quenched? 
You can find that in God. But it's not in the temporary. It's in the eternal. You see, the last thing that Jesus saw, he saw the people. He identified them. He saw the problem, but also then when he saw the problem, he was the provision. A lot of you see people and you see their problems. But maybe we're not willing to do anything about it. You know, all of you have probably been watching TV before and you're sitting there with a big plate of food. You know, you're sitting in your recliner eating and then they have to put those stinking commercials on there of a kid starving somewhere. I shouldn't say stinking. I mean, it's real. And you almost for a second feel guilty because you're sitting here with a big plate of food and there's kids somewhere else in the world and even here in this country that are going hungry. And you either flip the channel really quick because it bothers you or you endure it and you go on you don't think anything more about it. The next minute, you're, it's gone. You know, sometimes we do that even in life, in church, in our families, in, in our communities. We see a problem, we identify the people, and then we never do anything about it. I thank God that this church is doing something about things. And it all has to do with food. I don't know why God has chosen this church, but God has chosen this church to feed people, right? Whether it's boxes of food, whether it's the, the feeding program, the food ministries, the, the, the funeral dinners that we do, the, the carrying food out to people. It just seems like it's always food. But I think that's right in line with what Jesus would have us do. And everybody knows the crisis going on right now, not only in this country, but right here with what gas prices are doing. And just so you know, it has nothing to do with anybody here. It has something to do with way, way down the pike. We're going to have people that aren't going to be able to pay gas bills. They're going to struggle. And I think we need to step in and say, you know what? If they, they may need food so they can save that extra money to help pay their gas bill. And we need to see the people and see the problem, try to help them any way we can. The provision Jesus offered them, I know I've got to keep going. There's so much good stuff here. In, in verse 27, Jesus offered them a different kind of food that endures, that is everlasting, that is permanent, that they would never go hungry again. His audience, in verse 28, the crowd say, well, what can we do? How do we work the works? They went back to the works of salvation. They went back to the, the old way, the, the, the Jewish way. If, if I work hard enough, I can get to heaven. Folks, I'm telling you right now, you cannot work your way to heaven. There is no way. You can feed a million people, but if you don't know Jesus, you will die and go to hell. You can do all the good works, but those good works all sin and all fall short of God's glory. So all people short of Jesus will die and go to hell. I have a whole other story I could tell to that, but I'm not going to do it right now. God will give it to me another time. In verse 29, Jesus says, it's not about works. This is the works of God that you believe in him who sent, who God sent. Who did God send? He sent Jesus as the bread of life. I'm going to lay my life down for you. If you don't, and it goes on in this chapter. In fact, I want you also to read John chapter 6 this afternoon, this week, the whole chapter. He goes on, he says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, they misunderstood that. But Jesus said, if you don't take me on to you, if you don't take it all in, you cannot be my disciple. What's Jesus saying? If you don't take all of me, you can't have any of me. If you don't take it all in, you can't have any of it. And many of the multitudes at that time, just like in verse 36, I say to you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. Multitudes of people hear about Jesus, know about Jesus, but they don't really believe in Jesus. Why? It was too hard, they said. It's too hard. Let me tell you this. Is it harder to give up what you have now to receive eternity, or is it harder to have everything now and die and be separated from God for eternity. Jesus said, you can't work. you got to believe. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Diane, will you, you want to come on forward, please? You know, there's a bread that this world is searching for, in it, and you're not going to find it in a grocery store. You know, Lisa and I was down in Mississippi last week. Remember that? Some of you missed me. Some of you didn't even know I was gone, right? 
Mike, thank you for filling in last week. I watched your message. It was a powerful message. Very good. Lisa and I were down to Mississippi, and guess what? They've got this junk down there. It was 60, 70 degrees the week before we went. It's 60, 70 degrees this coming week, and it was 25 when we were there. Who says God doesn't have a sense of humor? But you know what God did? God forced us to slow down, and, and we were at Doug and Sandy's. We were in a hotel room. We was at, at a nice home with a big fireplace with lots of wood, and we sat back and drank coffee and visited, and we relaxed. And that's what we needed more than anything to relax. But you know, there's some things that are universal. I can tell you one thing. The folks in Mississippi, they don't know how to handle this. They don't have the road equipment to take it off. They don't have the salt to put on it. We just, we sat tight. You know what? Those guys are crazy drivers down there on this stuff. They have no idea how to drive. But about three days in, Doug and I, we decided we was going to venture into the um, local grocery store there in town. Their, their town's about, about the size of Pleasant Hill, maybe a little bit bigger in, in, in like businesses and stuff, but about the same size. But we went into the local grocery store. It'd be about like going into Bob's store down there. And we went in there, and you walk in, and there's a thousand people in there. And you know what's up. They are out because we got to get to the grocery store. We haven't been for a few days. And guess what? You already know. We walked down the aisles, and guess what? Two things were gone. There was not a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk in that whole store. Why is it that people think they can't survive without milk and bread? I mean, the first thing that pops into your minds, most people's minds, is if it's going to storm, i got to go get milk and bread. Now, I may have T-bones in the freezer, and I may have plenty of potatoes and vegetables. i got to have milk and bread. And I thought about this. Jesus offers us all the bread we could ever want. There's no storm that can stop it. You may be going through a storm in your life right now. There is no road that can shut down that not let you come to Jesus. There is nothing that would stop you from receiving the bread of life. Jesus is offering us not a, an expirational bread, but an eternal bread and giving him his, us his life. I think about how many people fight for that bread here on this earth. And Jesus came and said, I am the bread of life. You believe in me it's not about works you can receive it you know the question I would have for you as we wind this down today where do you identify in this story that's what I would ask you where do you identify in this story maybe you're one that you're oblivious to the people around you. You've got so many things going on, you're not seeing who God's put right in front of you. And even if you know those people, you really don't know their problems because you don't take time to find out what's going on in their life. And God says, if you're going to offer them the bread of life, you have to see their problems first and identify with that. You know what Jesus did? He gave them bread and fish. But he took that physical need and he turned it into a spiritual opportunity. I'm praying through all the things that we're doing here in this church that we're seeing everything as a spiritual opportunity. Whether it be, be passing food out, whether it be serving people, whether it be a ladies' Bible study, whether it be a group getting together, whatever it may be, and oper some opportunities that we're going to present to you here in the future, near future, of ministering to people who need Jesus. It's not enough just to see them know it you got to do it provide if Jesus provided you the bread of life what could you what could he ask you to do that would be more than he gave to you I think we can serve God a whole lot more if we stay focused on that maybe you're here today and you can identify with the crowd you've kind of been you know a follower of Jesus you kind of like that you know this Jesus stuff and maybe you're listening at home maybe you're sitting here but, but you've never really given your life to the bread of life. You will search and you will seek and you will have that void for eternity if you don't give your life to Jesus. It just can't happen. And you need to come out of that crowd and say, I believe in Jesus. Not just in my head, but now it's in my heart. 
knowing him as my savior you may be going through a difficulty right now a storm and you're thinking how is it ever going to happen remember jesus fed twenty thousand people with with two fish and five loaves he can take care of us and he has and he will he can take care of you do you trust him and then finally maybe there's something there that god spoke to you that i haven't even talked about there's something that's worthy of coming maybe to this altar or bowing your head at invitation time where you sit and just praying, God, I see. I know you're speaking to me about this and I need to, I need to give it to you. I need to deal with this. I need to pray about this. I need whatever it is. You be open to God today. Jesus is the bread of life. If you come to him, whether you're lost for salvation or whether you're saved, to be fed and nourished and revived. He can do that today. Father, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for your word. Once again, I stand on your word. Jesus, you are the bread of life. I am. You are God. God's son in the flesh. You offered that eternal bread, that everlasting bread, to never be hungry, never be searching to satisfy us. That inner need that we have for you, for a relationship with you and the Father. I pray if someone needs Christ today, Lord, that they would come to the great I am with repentance in their heart. I pray for us as believers that we would always see the people, see their problems, and provide through the power and the promises of Jesus. As we approach this Easter time, Lord, I pray that we would keep our eyes focused on you in a way like we never have before. To the great I am. Jesus, you are the bread of life. I thank you coming and giving your life for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that God's word spoke to you today in a powerful way. If you made a decision today, we would love to know about that decision. If you would uh, let us know, there's a couple ways. You can just give us a word here on the Facebook page and let us know the decision you made. Send us a personal message. Uh, even on my page, you can do that. Or you can call the church, uh, call the church office. You can leave a message on the answer machine. The number is 217-734-2145. And let us know of the decision you made. Or if you'd like to know more about a decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to have a personal relationship with Him, uh, we'd love to talk to you about that too. Also, as you know, uh, everything costs. Uh, the ministry of this church, the outreach of this church, it costs. And we'd like to offer you the opportunity to join in with us. Uh, we would like to ask you to maybe pray about giving something towards the ministry of this church. If you're being blessed by it, we would love for that to be a blessing we could use to reach others. Uh, you can do that by going to our church website. Our church website is fbcphill.org. That's fbcphill.org. And when you get to our homepage, you can click on the link Give. And when you click on that link Give, you can see that there's one of two ways that you can give. The first one is simply our address. It's First Baptist Church, Box 285, Pleasant Hill, Illinois, 62366. And also, there'll be a link that you can push, a tithely link, to give online. It's a very safe and very easy way that you can give online. You can go there and it'll prompt you to exactly how you can give to the ministries of this church. You can do it as a one-time gift, or you can do it as an ongoing weekly gift to give of your tithes and offerings to the Lord and the work that God is doing through this ministry here at this church. God has great things in store, and I'd love for you to be part of that through giving financially. And then finally, I'd like to ask you to do something for me personally. Would you please share this message? I say this over and over, but you cannot understand the impact that you can have by simply sharing this message on your Facebook page. You can just push share and hundreds of people may see the gospel, some for the first time, some to listen, some to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Wouldn't you like to be a part of that? Just simply click share and you can be a part of that. So until next time when we worship the Lord once again, I want to ask you just to stay in God's word, to stay in prayer, to stay focused on the Lord, 
And I pray that God will bless you and keep you until we come together again. God bless.